I'm probably going to deviate a bit from what is actually written on the, uh, the screen since you can all look it up later and read it. Um, my original idea for the Black Hole Mobile Observatory, which is a 34 inch F 2.89, it's 2.3 inches thick. The mirror is about 139 pounds uh, quartz. Uh, it was originally a sphere and it was polished out to a parabola by Mike Lockwood. Uh, the controller is a SciTech Force One. Dan Gray was made and the telescope itself is made by me. Um, some of the things I'm gonna cover today is why I wanted a larger scope, what I wanna do with it, how I'm gonna use it, um, where and how I got the parts to build the telescope. Uh, transportation was key because I wanted it to be mobile so I could take it out and, and use it for outreaches and things. And some of the differences in building a 34 inch compared to a 20 inch that I built about, oh, I guess an eight years ago now. Um, and some of the problems along the way uh, up to the point where I actually got this scope out to first light at the Golden State Star Party, which was uh, it's about a month and a half ago, wasn't it? Oh, late June. Late June, yeah. So. Um, also on the right side, you can see Newt for the web. Uh, this is, I'm going to be more meat and potatoes than the fine dining we just had with the, uh, the solar clips. Uh, if you're going to design a telescope, this is a wonderful tool. It's free online. Also, Mel Bartels has a wonderful program that does a lot of similar things, but probably better. Um, but it lets you put in your mirror size, your thicknesses, and it calculates a lot of the things for you. And uh, it's just a great resource. So the why is to share the amazement of the night sky. Um, you can see some of my photos here of Oregon Star Party. Uh, the middle photo is the 14 and a half inch I built uh, with super lightweight, I think 38 pounds for the the OTA for 14 and a half. And then my 20 inch, which is 68 pounds with the mirror and secondary. Um, so I was, I'm into really more composites and lightweight. Uh, the 34 is much heavier. Uh, before I go further, I should probably give you some of my background. Again, it's Christopher Tribe. Um, I got an associate's in electrical engineering and a bachelor's in automated manufacturing. And I currently work at uh, Microchip Semiconductor as a diffusion uh, engineering technician. And that's what I do for work. And this is my hobby. <laughs> so um, here's some pictures of some of the outreach programs I've done. I've worked with the Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts. Uh, Middle picture is Rooster Rock State Park, where I take my 20 inch out and share it with people. I really enjoy sharing the views of the instruments I built. And it gives me great pleasure to see that spark of interest from kids that get up at the IP. Some of this kind of, oh, okay, that's cool. Others are just like, wow. And they're over at their parents and they're talking about, I want a telescope and they're really into science. And it's like, there we go. Even if it's one in 10, if you get that spark, it's like there's, there's someone who's going to study science throughout their life. So that's really important to me. So um, yeah, sharing is a big, big part of it. Uh, for me, I have to have checklists. If I'm going on vacation. I got to make a checklist. It's how I keep track of things. Um, you know, I started off with after the 20 inch using it at the Oregon star party, I'd look through a couple of the larger telescopes. And I'm like, wow, I really enjoy that view. I want to have that view too. So um, I found a mirror, was able to ship it to advanced glass industries in New York, um, have one side generated to F 3.3. And I kept the parabola, um, 
F2.89, which was a sphere. And uh, it turned out, turned out pretty good. Um, it was a lot of risk getting it shipped off, but so How thick was it, originally? it was five and a half inches. Yeah. Why didn't you generate it? Well, it was already there. One side was already generated. And the deal was I get it cut in half, give the 3.3, which was almost, I think 3.2 inches thick to Mike Lockwood with some cash. And then he polishes my other one. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm on a budget. <laughs> uh, there was a lot of risk and a lot of wheeling and dealing, but we'll get into that. I'll talk about that more further on. Um, so I started gathering parts, I had to find a secondary. I found a company up in Canada, it's Hubble Optics. Uh, they sold me the cellular eight inch and then I shipped that off to Lockwood um, to be finished. Uh, Zambudo did the uh, mirror coating on it. He does up to 24 inches now. Uh, he has a really good process for coating mirrors. Um, and then I created a Facebook page and I also have comments in Cloudy Nights. So it also has a lot more photos if you, if you wanna look at my Facebook page or go to Cloudy Nights. Um, and then there's also the testing of the drive with, with Dan and his help made a big difference. So here's an actual picture of the blank on the right side. You can see it at five and a half inches. There is no guarantees. Uh, found it on eBay. Guy, they wanted originally $12,000 for it. Um, I got it for 10,000. I offered that, that was including shipping and it went off to get cut. It made it, didn't break, big relief. <laughs> um, and again, once I had the two separate blanks, they shipped off to Mike Lockwood in, I think it's Ohio is where he's at. And he kept the one and I kept the other after he finished taking it from a severe sphere to a parabola. Um, when the mirror was at AGI, they were the ones who originally created this blank for Livermore Laboratories. And it was quite a bit north of $200,000 is what they paid for that quartz blank. So getting it for 10 k it's, it's a lot of money, but it's a heck of a lot cheaper. And considering that half of that went towards, well, I came out pretty good for finished mirror. And that's how it arrived to me from my clockwood. 34 inch, brand new. Sat like that for five years while I built the scope around it. <laughs> I opened up the crate. I looked at it, measured it, took some pictures, put it right back in the crate and kept it that way. Um, another great find for $800, including shipment, was this lot of 80-20. Uh, these bars on the bottom are 72 inches long, so there's quite a bit of material there. It doesn't look too much like in the, the photo, but that pretty much built everything I needed for the, the telescope, and I still have some leftover pieces. Uh, I did have to buy some Z bolts and a couple other uh, brackets and things, but, you know, 800 bucks shipped to my door. That was a good deal. Base bearing is a bearing that was made for an electrical truck hoist. So it's when you see the guy standing up in the back of, uh, basket working on your electrical lines, um, the base bearing is what that's for. They're normally about $3,000. I got it for $350 off of eBay. Uh, one thing I did do is the grease was a really heavy grease in the bearing pack. So I disassembled the bearing, cleaned all the bearings and all the spacers that are in there. And I used a uh, low temp grease that does not get more viscous. Um, it will go down to minus 40 degrees because I knew there's going to be some cold nights outside. And last thing I want is the drag on the turn 
uh, increasing. So I have a, a grease now in there that does not increase in uh, drag as it goes through the night temperature. Okay. Sure. What's the diameter of that? The diameter of that 24 inches. Well, actually, that's 20 inches. The outer ring with the coils is 24. So, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a heavy duty. Um, next step was to start building the mirror cell. And like I've used on past telescopes, I really believe in a material called Nomex. And it's a honeycomb material. Uh, you'll see that in the next slide. And when you laminate carbon fiber to each side, it becomes extremely stiff and strong. Uh, I have a sample over there that you guys can look at after the talk, uh, but it works really well. Super light, super strong. And because you've got a sandwich in a space, uh, the fibrous material sucks in the epoxy and makes it really strong and stiff. And you end up with something that is, works really well. And it's really lightweight. And there's a uh, DuPont's description of Nomex and some of the things that it's used for. Uh, helicopters, planes, boats, things where you want a high strength, strength ratio to weight. Okay, so in my head, things go differently than they actually go <laughs> in real life. Um, I wanted to make the inside of my primary mirror cell. And I had to build a barrel, which is the wood structure with slats. So I took and cut my two round plywoods and then mounted four two by fours to make sure I had equal spacing. And then I uh, stapled all these slats all the way around. And that gave me the, the shell of the inside diameter of what I wanted. And then in the lower left, you see this kind of shiny material. That is a Teflon coated material they use in making solar panels. Nothing sticks to it. It's what they uh, run the panel in and then they heat it and the glue melts in between. And then it just peels open and lets the panel come out without the, the glue sticking to it. Uh, it worked really well. I was able to um, wrap the carbon fiber around it and add the epoxy and let it dry. And it came out, you'll be able to see the finish in the, in the scope itself and some of the other pictures, but it came out pretty good. And that gave me a, a real good base for what I was doing. Wife was not too happy about me rolling out the carbon fiber in the living room on the hardwood floors, but uh, I eventually talked her into it, made sure everything was covered, not gonna get <laughs> on the floors or anywhere else. Oops. Um, as I was make, making motors at the same time as I was gluing the epoxy, um, it takes a couple days for the epoxy I was using to really set up and be solid. So I'd wind coils. Uh, I have a machine that I bought and that's further on that allowed me to wind the coils using the same number of counts and, and in the same direction. Uh, in the lower uh, photo, you can see that I have a frame and there's two beams, one on top and one on the bottom with two little beams that I used to measure. So that I had the exact same spacing. So I had, had them in parallel and that allowed me to make sure my bearing mounts were exactly at the right spacing and parallel from top to bottom. So I, literally I was using a micrometer to measure um, the variances between left, you know, top and bottom to make sure that those were square. And if you rotate my scope, there's no binding anywhere. It's really smooth from uh, straight up to all the way uh, across. So that turned out really well. And all this is done in a garage. You know, I'm on the cheap. <laughs> so I, I, you know, it's stuff I've gathered through the years and learned how to to build and searching through eBay and things like that. Um, here we're back looking at uh, 
my mirror cell, my primary mirror cell that I'm putting together on my wife's cherry wood table. <laughs> oh. Oh. Yeah, yeah, no, I didn't get anything on it, but I have that Teflon paper covering it again. But uh, you can see the, the, the tube inside turned out really well with that carbon fiber. And that's basically the inside of the primary cell. Um, for the mirror cell itself, you can see the three set points. Uh, that's where the actual polymation bolts are supporting the mirror itself. So I have really heavy duty support points at the critical point spots so that there's no movement in the cell when it goes through uh, tilt. And I tested all of this by putting it on the floor and measuring the flexure by actually took a 42 inch plate table, plate glass table and set it on the cell and added weight to it to see how much flexure there was. And it uh, was within limits. There's incredibly small amount of flexure, but um, very happy. Oh, okay, on to the motors. And uh, without Dan's help, I had been stuck a few times. He actually talked me into not giving up the project at one point. Um, each coil had to be hand wound. Uh, there's 56 coils total. I have my base and my two rotationals that are working in parallel for the rotational and this single one in the, the base. Um, they have to be, as you wind the coils, they have to be wound with the same number of wraps, the same thickness, and you have an input and an output of the coil. And everyone has to be in that series. You got the input, output, input, output, and it's every third coil. So you got A, B, and C makes your, uh, your motor drive because you're, you're running a three, is it three, not a three phase, but it is three phase. a three phase. Okay, so, and if you get any of those backwards, you have a dead coil, a dead spot in your scope and it won't work. So there's a lot of time spent measuring, you know, clipping the, the wires and measuring the, the counts and everything. This is the coil winder I purchased. It was cheap. They're like $30, $40. Uh, you take the handle off and you put a drill on it. And you, you run the drill and you sit there and you have a little bit of a feed um, through some kind of drag unit. So your feed coil of wire is off one side and you put a little drag on it and you run the drill and you, you feed it and you watch the counts. And for me, I was using a hot glue gun. I know Dan's used epoxy, um, whatever w works for you. Uh, uh, if you're in a uh, condition of, of overcurrent for extended period of time, the hot glue might melt. Understand, then you'll I'll get to what I did to address that problem. Um, but for assembly, you have to have something to hold the, the coils together. Otherwise, they'll go, and it, it's a mess. Um, the advantage with the hot glue for me was that I could put them in a press, put them in the oven, let them sit with, you know, with the accurate spacers. And with that force, after uh, 20 minutes at the, I think it's 230 degrees where the glue just starts to melt. When you take them out, they all came out exactly the same thickness because they settled in and they, you know, they fit. Um, so that worked out really well for me to make sure I had all the same height coils. Even though I had spacers when I wound it, there'd still be a, you know, a, a wrap or something that might be sticking up a little bit, but once you've done this, they're flat. And the oven is um, in your garage or in your kitchen? No comment. Oh. <laughs> hey, you use what you got. <laughs> you operate at a very high WAF. I, I admire you. <laughs> you know, I, I don't let the uh, door gets in the way, I find a way around it or open it. <laughs> <laughs> you get kicked out of it. <laughs> All right. um, so the other thing that's critical is that in each set of windings, your A, Bs, and Cs, 
because it's ABC, 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 ABC. Um, as you go around, you want each one of those to be the same resistance value because each coil has a slightly different resistance. And when you get that, the series of your A's and the series of your B's and the series of your C's, you'll measure them. And if they're off, it can cause some disruption. So what I did is I measured every single coil. And then I took all the coils I made and I put them in piles of what their resistance was. And then I distributed them so that when they were put into their sequence, the resistance you know, is 18.7, 18.8. They were all within that, that range um, for that specific set of coils there. And you can see in the lower photo, I have uh, all the different testing wires connected. I used, I think looks red, green, and black for each A, B, and C uh, for testing the coils. So I just wanted to test first, not have to repair later. So you mentioned that, that it was 18 uh, ohms. Is that including like, like from A to B going through the five coil? This was before I put the, the Y in, so. So this is uh, 18 ohms, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, yes. Okay. So, uh, one thing that I read was it, you get better conduction of your magnet fields if they're on a metal back surface. So I had a metal ring machine to press fit around my uh, main base bearing. And then I used the seam on base bearing as the place to drill. So I marked all my, my magnets as to where they were supposed to go. And then the screws actually act as a lock for that ring. To the, other, to the stainless steel bearing. Um, actually, it's not stainless, it's just steel, but it's, it's a solid unit now. And uh, so when I mounted the bearings, I basically made a solid system out of it because I had- So Chris, uh, what did you do to when you're, you're putting these magnets on one by one? Yes. Uh, what did you do to keep the magnet you're about to attach from attaching itself to the yes, this is critical. If you notice in here, I said caution is stressed because yeah. these these magnets will crush your fingers. You can break your fingers, stitches, things like that. Fortunately, I got lucky. I only shattered one magnet where it got away from me and <laughs> busted into pieces. But I used a spacer. So uh, Joel, uh, he's actually my nephew, uh, Joel Kaplan. He worked for SciTech a long time. And he came up with a really beautiful idea. You place one magnet by hand, and then he, he uh, said, well, why can't we 3D print something? And it's basically a slide with an empty bottom. But it's all one thing. And so you put it over the one you installed, then you install two more, and then you pop it over and keep on installing two more. Yeah, that's, kind, that's, sure that's kind of what I did. Yeah, okay. I, I, I made a spacer so that, uh, it worked off the magnet that was already installed because that was basically a solid unit. It wasn't going anywhere once the first magnet's in. And then the, 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 the new magnet would slide in next to the spacer. And you also, with the magnets, you got to go north, south, north, south, north, south. Uh, if you get, get your polarities mixed up, you have a dead spot in your motor, it won't work. Um, but yeah, you, you got to be re, you got to use real caution when you start. You're working with magnets. My magnets are a half inch by one inch by two inch, so they're they're pretty big. Um, I can't remember how much I paid for each magnet. I think it was about three hundred dollars for all my magnets. I got a pretty good deal off of them, but um, yeah, they they're not cheap. Okay. Do they come with the mounting holes already in them? Yes, the ones I bought came with the holes already in. Yeah. So then I just had to, you know, make a little template and then I went around and made all my drill points. And once the drilled out the holes and then tapped all the holes and then mounted them. Fortunately, it worked pretty good. Um, 
about this point in the project, uh, epoxy was drying on different parts of the telescope. I was cutting the uh, 8020, uh, found a carbon tipped blade that's meant for cutting aluminum, threw it on my chop saw, cuts just like wood. It's great. And, uh, you know, it gives really nice clean cuts. Measure, measure twice, cut once. Good thing to learn. <laughs> um, and I kind of started mocking up some of it. I got my base bearing put in place. Uh, I've got uh, my side bearings where they were going to kind of sit. I'm trying to, you know, get an idea how everything's going to fit together. Uh, some more pictures of, you know, how the 8020 goes together on the left. You can see where the bearing mount slides in the channel of the fork. So I can actually move my bearing up or down for adjustments. So not only for balance, but for left or right tilt, I can dial it in exactly um, so that they're even. Because both, both bearings are mounted to a slide unit that slides up and down inside the 8020 and then you just lock it in place and you're done. Uh, and you'll see that later on where I'm assembling it. Uh, so I found out that the three quarter inch rings I made for my barrel um, were good enough to hold in the aluminum strut connectors, but they were not that strong as far as flexure. If I push down on it, the tube would kind of squish. And I was like, well, that's not going to work. So I found a pipe fitting company that would make these aluminum flanges. And, you know, there's two or three of them in the country. I don't remember the name of the place I got these ones from. They were about $60 a piece. And I ordered uh, six of them. And one of them was bent. So fortunately, it, it worked out just right. I had enough, enough rings. I didn't have the extra one. I was gonna use it for a uh, secondary mount so that I could turn my, my secondary cage, but uh, it, it's fine. And here you'll see me standing on my tube, testing the strength. It's rock solid. With, with, with the new uh, rings, it doesn't flex at all. Uh, that secondary or that primary uh, cell is just solid as a rock. There's no flex in it whatsoever. Uh, also, you can see the baseboard where I have the three points for the mirror cell support. Um, what I used was vacuum, used vacuum valves that are recycled that had a ball screw for closing these massive uh, vacuum valves for vacuum pumps uh, for the semiconductor industry. And so those were a freebie, uh, you know, no, no backlash, no ship. They're really, really work well. So this is the baseboard for the mirror cell. Uh, I wanted it to be lightweight yet strong. So I took a bunch of uh, fans that was, were thrown away uh, every couple of years these fans fail and we were going through all of our tools and we were just throwing these fans away and I thought hey you know I could make a cellular structure out of this so I busted out the center part of the fan and you know they're square so I put them all together and epoxied them in place and worked great it's super strong um, when you've got two layers you know the bottom layer and the top layer it's unbeatable. Uh, here's me. This is gluing the uh, bottom layer on. I've got a bunch of uh, strut supports underneath, so it came out really flat. And when it was all together, I took this unit, set it on the floor with uh, three support points, stacked up a bunch of uh, tile boxes that are 40 pounds a piece. And then I stood on top of that, and there wasn't any flex in the mirror cell. And uh, yesterday, last night, the jack slipped on my telescope and it dropped about two inches, maybe three inches. And it was, you, you heard it, thud. 
And Howard looked at me and I says, huh, I'm not worried. <laughs> and you know it, it, it's fine nothing happened to it uh, it's just um the way it's designed the mirror is in its safest spot there's no question about that it's an 18 point support cell uh it's very well supported there's no flex in the system yet uh if if you do get a drop there is enough to absorb some of that but uh yeah, it seems to be working real well. In the bottom right, you can see the ball screws. I don't know if it shows up on the screen, but you can tell that they're not a regular screw. They're an actual ball, ball screw. Um, and it's, they go through a, a brass bushing there. And uh, so there's no side tilt and uh, it works really well. And those are mounted to the, can, yeah. Can you point with the mouse where your honeycomb thing is? My it honeycomb. The honeycomb for the support. The thing that you made out of all those pan pieces. Oh, it's in on the back side of this. It's in between. So there's the bottom right there, and there's the top. And the honeycombs are in here. Oh wow. Now all my wiring is routed in there. Um, let's let's see if you go back right here, you can see the wiring is in here, and then the fans are right here. I have a hole in the center, and uh, here's a testing of the fan right here. So everything's built internal. You don't see any wires. Everything's clean. I've got a little fan switch that sits over here so I can turn the fan on and off. Um, and then- You can remove those fans if they fail. Yes, I can. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So, and then here you can see my uh, collimation motors that drive a uh, gear that's mounted on this. And that'll drive the bottom two up and down, left and right. So I can be right at the eyepiece and dial it in. And uh, so far it's been working. I might want to go, I have a three RPM, but I should go to a six RPM because it's really slow. And there's the finished cell with all my garbage around it. <laughs> but um, yeah. And I went with uh, 360 degree support thinking that maybe in the future, I might go to a tilt access. So I, it's built strong enough with that bearing that'll hold 4,500 pounds that I could take it from a flat mount to a tilt mount, and then it would be tracking. Or and equatorial. yeah, I could go to an equatorial. So, uh, it looks like you have some sort of arrangement between the, the things that keep them straight. Can you explain that? Yeah, so keep, Oops. To keep these in place, I have a pin right here. So you've got your cross member that uh, tilts on this axis. Uh, these are at almost the same height as the top of the, uh, the pivot bearing here. And what that does is it equalizes the pressure of the mirror so that you don't have a lot of extra weight of mirror cell hanging out here. It's almost even. So as it goes through tilt, there's not weight pushing forward. This is something that my clock would help me with. Um, and to keep these in the proper place, I have a pin and they, it's loose enough that they sit and float on there. So when it's in place, they're not gonna rotate like this. Uh, there's a lot of, whoops. Uh, a lot of people will take a wire and tie off the pop, the points. Uh, I decided to go with the pins because I could accurately machine those holes in place. Okay, uh, this is my eight inch by 11.2 um, mirror. It's a, a cellular mirror. Again, that came from Hubble Optics and uh, the first mount I made, this one here, was of the carbon fiber cellular structure, but it wasn't the right size. Uh, when I had it mounted up, it was off center. It, it just was, I couldn't get the center to reach. So I ended up 3D printing a mirror cell, which is, I think that's about a half inch thick. Um, I have, a hard rubber grommet 
that these bolts go into, which are um, glued in place with RTV, RTV material. Uh, it's very solid uh, because it's a harder rubber, but it's not so hard that I couldn't take it apart if I had to. But uh, yeah, it mounts up really well. It's centered. I did a, a laser test on it to make sure that, you know, it's going to hit at the center where I wanted to. And as I rotate that it stayed uh, where I wanted with a slight offset. Uh, making the spiders. I bought uh, some st strips of stainless steel off of eBay and uh, proceeded to drill the starter holes, go to a bigger hole, and then use a uh, Greenlee hole punch. I don't know if you ever used one of these, but it's a hydraulic hole punch. And you just basically put your two pieces together, you use it like a jack, and it pops out a clean hole. It works really well and uh, time consuming, but it works. Um, so that gave me a yet light but strong stainless steel spider mounts for the secondary right here. Then I want to do, okay, so now we're moving on to my focuser. This is a really big deal. It's not, not many of these in the world right now. Um, on my 20, I have a feather touch uh, SIP system. And I really like having the paracord before your eyepiece. Because once you get your focal point set, you don't have to mess with anything. You just pop the eyepiece in, focus, you're done. No adjusting of the uh, external paracord. And I got a uh, good deal on a feather touch three inch, and I didn't realize it wasn't big enough to hold the, the three inch paracord that I wanted to use. Um, I decided against the two inch because I possibly wanted to take some photos down the road and I wanted that extra aperture so um, I could run like a 35 mil uh, sensor for the camera. So I sold that focuser and bought a three and a half inch feather touch focuser. And I printed out a representation of a paracord. That's this orange thing. It's exactly the same size as a three inch paracord. Uh, five, five inches long, three inches in diameter. And I use that for testing. This combination for this focuser mount was a 56 hour print for the base and another 20 some hours for the screws portion that holds the, uh, the paracord. Uh, and I printed it probably three or four times before I got to the right one. <laughs> uh, also, on the focuser I, I received, uh, it was a four and a half inch travel, and I didn't want a four and a half inch travel. Um, so I cut off an inch of that too. So it's a three and a half inch travel. And that worked really well with the focal point of where the paracord sits. And that's the 3D printer I purchased. There's tons of 3D printers out there. This one goes for about $900. You can get them on eBay or wherever. Uh, the CF Pro is a little bit more, but it'll print higher temperatures. And uh, carbon nylon, where this one only goes up to 260 degrees. But it's worked really well for me. And it's had really good reviews. So I've never... I'm printing in polycarbonate, carbon fiber. And that seems to work really well with the steel tip. And I also went up to a 0.6 from a 0.4. So it's a little heavier uh, material, but it doesn't plock up as much. Uh, the 0.4 tended to, to jam up with the carbon fiber particles in it. So with this setup, everything prints really well. Very few misprints. Um, I printed my uh, strut ends. You can see in the photo that these uh, ball mounts, they happen to be rubber and they probably should be a hard plastic or a aluminum because there's slight bit of flexure. And I'm almost certain that's where the flexure comes from when I go through full tilt. You can see the uh, shift in the laser column layers just slightly. Uh, everything else is really rigid on that thing. So that's probably where it's coming from. I have a solution with the stainless steel tip 
that'll go on there with a, a metal mount. I'm going to go to more of a real more mechanical mounting uh, probably this winter when I get more time. <laughs> but uh, it's working for now. So uh, here's a mock-up uh, in my garage. I don't have full roof clearance to be able to test with the secondary on there. So uh, it's a little limited, but it works. Again, some more pictures of the uh, feather touch focuser with the actual paracore mounted inside um, and with it extended and fully uh, retracted. Okay, so all that's together. Now we got to work on the motors. And again, I purchased some, oh, Renishaw encoder rings, uh, eBay for $675 each with the pickup units. And they're normally quite a bit more than that, but taking a risk, I ended up with the 10 meter cable, which I didn't want, I wanted a three meter cable, but because I could get a good price on them, I, I went with that. And with Dan's help, he gave me some tips and hints on how to set it up and stuff. So I started printing the mounts for the rings and adjusting and using the dial indicators as I was spinning it through the cycles. <coughs> and I'm like, gosh, I hope this works. Gosh, I hope this works. <laughs> and uh, so I, I got it everything as close as I could. Um, again, the coils aren't, aren't sealed yet. They're just still open to air. And, but everything's in a test mode. So Dan said he would, he would help me test it. So I, 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 I twisted your arm, twisted my arm. I was ready to give up and he twisted my arm and um, we, I hauled it out there in the back of my truck, just the base uh, fork mount. And uh, we got it in the shop and there's some videos of it actually moving uh, on my Facebook page. But uh, yeah, it's both of us standing on it and it rotated us just fine. And it went through its rotation. And Dan was like, I can't believe this. It works. Wow. Hey, you know, we had to nudge the uh, pickup unit just a little bit to get it to dial in so that it was green or blue is the best you can get. But green, if you can stay in the green and blue range, you're doing really good. So yeah, it rotated and tracked and fed back the numbers and it, did a little tuning on it and we were like, woohoo, this is great. <laughs> so went to load it back in the truck and I broke my toe. <laughs> that was not fun. <laughs> Still hurts. But uh, yeah, it's, it was, it, it, it's been a very interesting process. Um, also at that time, you can see the wheels I have mounted on there, which were totally inadequate. But it let me get out to the shop and back. And those are for uh, stern mounted wheel uh, for like a Zodiac boat. They're only rated at 350 pounds and as it sits, they squish. So that, that system's been changed. Uh, okay, back to the secondary, some more pictures of the secondary. Um, and now that I had the motors tested, and like Dan was saying, you need epoxy to keep your coils together. If you use just hot glue and it heats up and they melt, they're going to come apart on you. So I have this high heat potting epoxy. A uh, little sticky, a little gooey. Uh, I wrapped it in tape so that it formed a wall. And I formed a wall on the inside and I poured this stuff in there and it covered up and set up real nice. And it's now the, the coils are locked in. They're not going anywhere. And it all came out level. So I'm very happy. It can get hot and it's not going to do anything. Uh, this is moving along. This is probably about three months before the Golden State Star Party, which was my goal. Um, so I've been working on this thing for five years. And in the last five months, I went from about where it sits here to having it finished. <laughs> there was a lot of laminating and uh, epoxying and making sure things work. I bought this flex board. It's really cool. It's about eight inches thick and you can just bend it 
and you can buy it so it either bends in the lateral or the longitudinal direction. So, you know, it's stiff one way, but really flexible. And you can just curl it around. Oh, this will be great. So I laminated my babinga wood to it because I was going to pop those in because I designed it where they would fit in the channels of the 8020 that went up and uh, just fit right in there with some foam in between. And I couldn't bend it. Like, oh shit. So I got been in one of them just breaks. I'm like, oh God. <laughs> so I ended up putting it on the table saw and cutting a whole bunch of slats in the back so that it would bend easier. And that's how I was able to uh, bend those in place. And so each panel that's in this, I would put a foam glue that would expandable foam glue and then immediately put the panel in place so the foam would fill in behind the panel. And now it's lightweight, strong, looks good, I think. Um, and I was happy with how it turned out. You can kind of see some of the little uh, slit cuts because there's a little bit of a ripple there where it's bent, but you know, you do what you can. In five years, what was the biggest one space? Motors. Uh, it was a lot, of, a lot of time winding and getting things ready and testing that. That was a lot of work but you can do it in your garage with a drill. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, yeah. But, you know, I did a lot of it before I talked to him, but yeah, yeah, without Dan's help, no question. Um, and it was time to put my mirror in place. This is about uh, three weeks before Golden State Star Party. <laughs> and I haven't done a final test on the motors. <laughs> uh, this was scary. I had to lift my, my uh, telescope with the mirror in in place into the fork mount. And as you can see, I'm literally hanging off a main beam in my garage. I have a you know 16 inch by eight inch beam that goes across the whole garage. So, I ended up going up and wrapping through several uh, beams and then testing that lift point. And it was solid. I was good there. I was a little worried about uh, the spots where the straps went, which were just to cut some, some brackets. But I lifted it up. And as you can see right here, these are the slide, the Z nuts. And uh, I'd get it started, wiggle it, go to the other side, wiggle it, and it would slide down a little bit more until I got it at the height I wanted to where the balance point was. And uh, that worked pretty close. I did some minor adjustments later, but uh, having that ability to slide those bearings up and down and measure the distance from the frame to the base of the bearing slide allowed me to match up and make sure that they were parallel and right where I wanted them. Um, then it was load up again. I rented a trailer this time and went up to meet with Dan to help me dial in the motors because they hadn't, and this was like a week before Golden State Star Party. Um, balance point was off a little bit. You'll notice if you look at this cage right here, and look at my cage way it is now. My focus point was off. I could focus on trees about from here to the far wall there, but I couldn't focus on anything different. But we were able to test the motor and help get it dialed in to where uh, it was tuned enough that it was usable. Um, and that was a big deal because without that, I, couldn't have, I wouldn't have been able to go to the star party. So we got it all tuned in and I just had to fix the focus point at that point. Did you touch remove material when you fix the focus? Well, you, you, you see how thick this is from here yeah. to here? Yeah. Uh, at that point, I could test to see where focus was as well. I was like, oh boy, I'm off by, but it was because I had the paracord. It was about five inches. <laughs> that was off. Is your assembly too long or too short? Too long. Too long. Okay. Yeah, it was too long. And if you look at it here, you oh. see how short this cage is? I lost a bunch of that distance 
and it helped with the weight. And by doing that, I was able to peel off several of the counterweights and it worked out really well. Um, so June 29th, I pull into the Golden State Star Party, having never seen a star in the telescope. He was gonna stay late, but it was cloudy. Yeah, it just, we just didn't have time to test it again. And it's like, okay, well, here we go. So I, and I says, I got my 20 inches of backup and uh, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but we're gonna try. And so we loaded everything up and off to the Golden State Star Party. Very first night Wednesday was the very first light at the Star Party. And uh, after that, I had a line every night. There was a line. Um, I have to go to a little higher voltage for my motors so that it'll hold better at full angle. Every once in a while, I'll get an oscillation when I change the eyepieces because the weight shifts. It's really well balanced with an eyepiece in it. I mean, it's, it's very adjustable. And I could also use a weight, but I just want to have a little more current going to it so that it holds a little better. And I have a solution for that. I'm going to double the voltage at it. How much power, how much battery? I use these Ego um, lawn tool batteries and they have like battery indicators. And I go through a full night and not even use one bar. Uh, it just doesn't use hardly any power at all. And uh, so I have two batteries mounted on here. This one is for powering all the electronics. And that one is just for the motors. The motors are supposed to be on their own power supply with their own ground. It's, that's the way the controller likes it. Um, the one thing I really didn't like was this ground cable that goes to the computer because it would get wrapped and I'd have to constantly chase it around. And I was like, yeah, I really want this to be wireless. That was one of my goals is to have it wireless. So Taj and Dan were able to help me. Um, Taj, that's what I said. Not Dan. Okay, not Dan, <laughs> Taj. <laughs> um, helped me set up a Raspberry Pi for, um, what is that? Uh, cloud? the name of the software. It creates, a it creates a wireless connection to the uh, Pi 4 and that creates a virtual uh, port. From the Pi 4. Yeah, from the Pi 4. So on your, on your laptop, you, you connect to that wireless interface and it, and it creates Your serial port port. looks just like a normal port. Yeah, it creates a COM port. And I'll show you tomorrow on the, on the Demiscope. Uh, yeah, that and that's what we were using last night. No wires. When this scope sits out there now, there's zero wires to it. I can be in the trailer, I could be at a table, I could be, you know, up to the point of transmission of the, the wireless and running my scope. Laptop is connected. Yes. It's controlling it just as if I had a cable plugged into the laptop. I do, but the Force One does not have a powered port. It does, it's not like the uh, controller two that has a powered port where you can plug in the Bluetooth. This one has a serial port. You plug it in to a cable that goes to a computer. And most of these are site installed. They're not built to be moving around. Um, and I'm sure Dan will talk more about this, but I want wireless because I want it to be portable. It's the, it's, yeah, so the, I have the, the lowest model that you sell, and I plug in your Bluetooth, and it's awesome. But Force One doesn't have that. You can't plug the Bluetooth into that thing, so therefore it's a Raspberry Pi with a wireless, and then your laptop's ten feet away. That's yep. Right. Yep. Okay. Yep. Sweet. And it works. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so the long conclusion is yeah it works i had a great trip and the, the scope has a few things to change that are minor i uh, kind of have a good idea on what they are and how to fix them but it is very usable as it sits it's portable i brought it here in my truck i'm going to take it home in my truck don't need a trailer for it although i do have a nice camping trailer with a ramp that folds down that makes it even easier to get in and out but uh 
I reached my goals. I started off with a checklist and I went through it. And overall, I'd say I have about $23,000, $24,000 into everything for a 34 inch scope. And, you know, that's a lot of money for me, but it's still considering what it does and what it is. Yeah. Uh, what's, your, what's your next project? Uh, <laughs> there isn't one. <laughs> um, it, I didn't talk about it much, but building a 34 inch compared to a 20 inch night and day in the amount of labor, time, um, stresses, uh, you got a lot more weight you're dealing with unless you've got a meniscus mirror, which may uh, change the industry. I think it is really. Uh, this one's only 2.3 inches thick. It's about as thin as you're gonna get from a regular mirror manufacturer um, until you go to a uh, slumped, but uh, it's got good optics. Uh, 2.3 fused quartz is a really good mirror at f2.89. And with the coma corrector, we, the moon and everything looked pretty flat. Uh, and the stars at the star party looked great. Uh, M17 looked 3D. Best view I've ever had. I could see all the dust lanes and the sea. I just, it was gorgeous. And, you know, so in the right conditions, it's great. It's not practical for every location. You know, it's much easier to set a small scope up in light polluted areas than it is this. But if I'm going out to a school or someplace that's dark, yeah, I'll take this with me. I'll set it up for the kids. I'll set it up for the parents. It's uh, something I like and enjoy doing. And it give, gives an opportunity and a gateway, even if it's a big scope, I can still recommend, you know, hey, binoculars. That's what I always recommend. Go with a good set of binoculars. Just look up. And I always take my binoculars with me so they can see, oh, wow, I didn't know you could see that much. You know, I look in at Jupiter, they can see the moons and stuff in a good set of binoculars. They're easy, they're cheap, they're a good way to start. If you like what you see in binoculars, you can get a scope and you can move up from there. So, um, just, just sure. real briefly, there's a lot of people online that don't know that you took it out and set it up and it's how terrible the, the light situation <laughs> and, and what we did last night. Uh, so, so Dan was uh, asked me about last night and what we did, and uh, I, I set my scope up last night, and we were out looking at uh, Jupiter, Saturn, the Moon, um, Neptune. So we got to see all these different planets. I did a one point alignment off of uh, the Moon, and from there I was able to go to Saturn. It was within the field of view after a one point alignment. Did another point uh, for Saturn, and then we went to Jupiter. It was in the, the field of view. Did another alignment point and moved all the way over to M13. And Dan was at the controls then, and he found it with just, just a couple little taps, and we did another alignment. And from then on, we were moving from the Jupiter to Saturn, the moon back to Saturn, depending on what people wanted to look at. And this is from a massive street light right above the telescope and surrounded by a bunch of other lights. So conditions were not great, but it was still fun. We had a great time. So, and everything tracked and worked the way it was supposed to. So, um, at some point, I'd like to show the transport system. It's called a mini mover two. It's used for moving trailers. You can get them online for about $350. They'll move up to 6,000 pounds. It moves my scope like butter moving it around, it's got a little clutch on it and you can move it across the flats really fast. And then when you wanna to go to a ramp, you lock the clutch in and drive it up. Um, so if you have something that's heavy, it's something to consider. But uh, any other questions?